Committee Room 3, Sound. Sutherland, it's very kind of you to have come along to give evidence. You're the first in a long series of um, witnesses who were going to be discussing the EU's global approach to migration and mobility. And it's a great help to have you in your capacity as um, uh, advisor to the special representative to the UN Secretary General on this subject and also of course with your background both in trade policy and also at the Commission where you and I, I suppose I have to declare an interest, uh, did have some many dealings in the long distant past. Um, as you know the session is open to the public. A webcast of the session goes out live as an audio transmission and is subsequently accessible via the parliamentary website. A verbatim transcript will be taken of your evidence. This will be put on the parliamentary website. And a few days after this evidence session, you will be sent a copy of the transcript to check it for accuracy, and we'd be grateful if you could advise us of any corrections as quickly as possible. And if after this session you wish to clarify or amplify any points made during your evidence or have any additional points to make, you're welcome to submit supplementary evidence to us. Um, perhaps uh, I know you would like to make a, a brief opening statement and that would be very welcome to the committee. So could I perhaps uh, invite you now to do that <coughs> and then we'll move on to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Halley. <coughs> well, first of all, let me say <coughs> that I'm honoured to have been invited to um, give evidence to And I was anxious to make a preliminary statement because I want to make it clear that the experience that I've had in this area is linked, but not directly, to the development of the European Union. Uh, position. I have, I, have, I have some views on the latter, but perhaps I should first of all briefly explain how I am engaged in this. In 2005, Kofi Annan uh, contacted me and uh, said to me, in effect, that one of the two or three great global issues of our time was the issue of migration and migration policy that there were no proper structures, multilateral structures, for the discussion of migration policy and the creation of connections between countries of origin, transit, and destination. Uh, that there were bilateral agreements, uh, bilateral discussions. The IOM, uh, whilst by its name purporting to be an international organization for migration covering all aspects, is not within the UN family and not everybody uh, agrees with everything that the IOM stands for or its constitution, although I must say it's been extremely helpful to me. So he asked me <clears throat> in the context of a 2006 high-level dialogue taking place in the General Assembly to look at the issue, uh, having had the experience of being there at the foundation, so to speak, of the WTO to see what might happen in the area of international uh, discussions on migration policy. <coughs> um, I took on, uh, on that particular task and um, discovered that there were a couple of fault lines that made it very difficult to make progress. On the one hand, there was a group uh, of countries, uh, which I must say I had full understanding for, who had a significant reluctance about the creation of a, an organization within the uh, United Nations dealing with migration. And therefore, that road was not one that could pop possibly have uh, been acceptable to a significant number of uh, member states of the United Nations. 
second issue was, well, if it is not possible to proceed by way of setting up a structure within the United Nations, what can be done? And the conclusion that we came to was that it might be possible to set up <clears throat> what was to become the Global Forum on Migration and Development. The Global Forum on Migration and Development, as you'll see from its website, was set up with the agreement following the high-level dialogue by the General Assembly. And it was no more than a structure for annual communication at a four or five day conference, which would be held alternatively in countries of destination or origin, and that this discussion would take place um, on the invitation of a member state. And each year since 2006, the Global Forum has taken place and it has moved from north to south throughout that period. In the south we've had, for an example, uh, meetings in Mexico and um, uh, uh, the Philippines, to take two obvious examples of countries of origin. And <clears throat> 160 countries normally attend. During the interval between the uh, Global Forum meetings, um, we have uh, set up a structure in Geneva which um, uh, is made up, first of all, at its head by the troika of countries, the country that is currently hosting the preceding host and the, and the subsequent host. And that troika uh, provides a sort of governing structure. Under the governing structure, there is what's called a steering committee. The steering committee has been formed by member states who have shown a commitment to the process and the United Kingdom is one of those countries. And we meet in Geneva once a month or so with the steering committee to prepare and develop papers and proposals for the annual meeting which will take place this year, for an example, in Mauritius in November. Um, the European Commission has been particularly helpful to this process and I think that they perhaps see it as uh, something that naturally fits in with the global approach to migration and mobility. And uh, this nexus between, I, the nexus between uh, development and migration was a key element in getting this proposal across the line in the first instance in 2006. And the reason I say that is that there were a number of member states, including particularly at the time the United States, who were absolutely opposed to any initiative relating to migration taking place within or under the umbrella of the United Nations on grounds of concern about sovereignty. With the change of administration in the United States, that position has incidentally changed in the interval, and the United States is now part of the steering group and therefore we have virtually the whole global community working in this, uh, in this process. We have another high level dialogue coming up next year which in the United Nations which uh, uh, will map whatever route there may be into the future and that will not include in my view, <coughs> will not include in my view the creation of a UN organisation for migration because the will for that, at least, has not been demonstrated and a large number of company, countries would oppose it. But um, the structure, which I won't go into and bore you um, uh, with, um, of the Global Forum, has become concrete. We have a small secretariat. We've been supported by some NGOs uh, and foundations. For example, the MacArthur Foundation. We've been uh, helped by various countries. Uh, financially, including the United Kingdom, but purely voluntarily, not on the basis of any quota. And uh, that support mechanism has become um, uh, something that takes place almost, um, uh, it takes place annually, and those who've uh, provided support have, have not backed away subsequent to their first initial engagement and have continued supporting the financially, uh, the um, operation of the Global Forum. 
at the Global Forum meetings, finally, uh, countries between North, North and South and um, uh, transit origin and, and destination meet and often create bilateral connections and policy for uh, the development of uh, where they are going and what they are doing. Um, I should say in parenthesis that it's not clear to me, and this is at a very early stage, that the European Commission, who in my opinion have done, has done an enormous amount of very valuable work on this, is welcomed even as an observer by all member states in the Global Forum. The key element of the Global Forum is that it is state-led, state-directed, uh, that it is non it is not it will not result in binding resolutions or binding requirements in regard to conventions or otherwise, but it is a forum for dialogue. There is currently some debate, therefore, as to what role, if any, the Commission, in terms of its actual engagement, can play. I personally would think that the Commission should play a role, if only as a, a an ideas factory, so to speak. The final point I would make and I'm probably going on far too long, but uh, they, the final point I would make is that we've, been tr we've tried to do two things to create greater coherence in regard to this process. First of all, we've tried to bring together under a thing called the GNG, the Global Migration Group, all of the UN agencies who have an interest in this, who normally operate in different lines of activity, UNHCR, IOM is part of this, even though it's not in the UN, IOL, and so on. To get them, the original idea was that they would combine sufficiently to create the secretariat that would operate and run this whole operation. Because of internecine warfare between these, they haven't functioned effectively. In fact, it's been appalling, in my opinion, the lack of, uh, the lack of engagement. Uh, well, there's been engagement, and some of them have been extremely helpful. IOM, World Bank, uh, UNHCR in particular, but they haven't come together effectively. The other point I would make finally is that we have instituted a number of things that are related to domestic policy which are of some value. One of the key issues it seemed to us from the very beginning was the lack of coherence in national policy. And the, one of the reasons for that was that there wasn't a mechanism often in many member states to bring together different departments, all of which had an interest in the area of migration. In fact, the field was often occupied solely by those in charge of border controls, departments of justice or home affairs, and other relevant areas, um, uh, including foreign affairs, social welfare, development, and so on, were not there. Um, and uh, we asked, therefore, each country to produce a focal point. And the focal point was to be an individual in a relatively senior position in each member state who would try to draw together in some coherent way at national level, because we certainly couldn't do it, a response to the various initiatives which we were trying to take. And that has worked to some effect. We've recently had a professionally conducted assessment of the whole operation to date, conducted in all the member states, with all of them replying to what we asked in regard to assessing the value of this whole process, and it got an overwhelming thumbs up. And not that that necessarily proves anything, but I think it certainly gives an indication of some degree of support. Virtually no country in the world, and they're all now engaged in it, think that this is a waste of time. They all think it's, it's worthwhile and valuable. So that's my background uh, and, uh, and my, my, my personal capacity in this, insofar as I have any, has been related far more to process and getting a rather complicated show on the road and working out the, the way that one might do it far more than the substance of the arguments which I believe are, of course, of great importance to the world as to whether migration is or is not a good thing and how it should best be conducted. So I'm sorry if I went on uh, a little long, but uh, I think it's important to, to limit the...
the context with which I probably am able to, to help you, although I'm quite happy, like most of my race, I talk at a great length um, at the drop of a hat, and any, any, any subject or question you might ask me, I'll, I'll try and answer, however inexpertly. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Actually, I thought that was exceptionally valuable because you have really set the scene in a way which uh, none of the written submissions we've had uh, have done. And we've, I think I personally have gone up the learning curve quite a long way as a result of, of your explanation, which was admirably clear. Could I just ask one or two process sure. questions before we get into the substance? Uh, the meeting in Mauritius in November, yes. it will be very valuable to us to have the outcome of that, the, pub the public outcome yes. of that. If, if I could ask if the Secretary of our clerks could be in touch with your office so that you could let us have that. It's going to be a bit tight because we're trying to finish our report by Christmas. Yes. But it should be manageable and I think it will be very valuable to have that. Uh, secondly, could you tell us who the British focal point is of your system? I'm, I was afraid with the, your rapier like mine that that would be the first question you'd ask, and I d I've, I've haven't got the name. I should have the name. I the, don't. No, no, no. When I say because say, I don't if you could let me, me if you them. could let, but I will like, no, certainly because, let you know because yes. we will probably want to ask him, him or her, yeah. to come and give us some evidence about that. Uh, and thirdly, did I did you say that the commission? was not very welcome at the things. Does that to mean they... To some, they, to some member states. Are they there or are they not there? They're not there. They're not there. They're not there. Um, um, I, at the last meeting, um, particularly having regard to um, an interest that the Commission was displaying in regard to providing support, probably from the development budget, for a process which is directly linked, as our discussions mentioned, I'm sure of your discussions have already shown to, to development. Um, I asked them to attend, um, um, but a special representative of what is, uh, of the UN, of what is a state led system, I have no power to actually insist on this, and a number of member states uh, disagreed. And I'm talking about the certainly opposition within the European Union. Uh, what that's based on, whether it's based on a, an ideological position or not, or where the UK stands on it, as this only arose at the last meeting, I don't know. Um, uh, <clears throat> I should finally say that at the Mauritius meeting, which the UK is playing a, a, a role in, in developing, and the UK has been very constructively <coughs> engaged with this whole process from the beginning and very supportive of me personally, um, they, they, uh, the five days that we have in Mauritius, the way that we run them, I should tell you that finally, is two days with an NGO dialogue. Uh, bring NGOs together in an organized way, the host country providing an NGO leader uh, who will bring together the NGO community, and they come from all over the world, and they speak for two days on an agenda which is meant to feed into the state-led process that will follow. On the third day, you have a common space where the NGOs communicate with the government. And then the last two days, you have a purely intergovernmental discussion uh, on, on specific themes uh, relating to this. There's often a debate on this, incidentally, as to whether, <coughs> as we're meant to be discussing primarily, development and migration, whether issues like uh, human rights are directly related to this or not. That has now largely been overcome and it is generally accepted that human rights is a relevant issue and should be included and not excluded from this discussion. Yeah, well we'll follow up if we may the yeah. Mauritius point and the name of the British focal yes. point but we will of course follow up ourselves directly with the government and yeah. uh, their attitude towards the Commission's attendance at these meetings. Lord Richard. I just want to know what the agenda was. Well, <coughs> the agenda of the Global Forum yes. uh, is an agenda which covers a whole range of different subjects, all of subject? which, well, for an example, the whole issue of brain drain. It deals with the issue, and one of the first issues we dealt with, and I think we've made significant progress on, is the issue of remittances. 
we're looking now at the issue of diaspora involvement in the development of national economies and how we can engage them. Uh, we look at the issue of human rights. Uh, uh, there would be, at, a, at, a, at each meeting of the Global Forum, there are at least 20 different tables and uh, discussion groups with professional papers produced for them, which cover the whole of issues relating to migration. Every issue you can think of is discussed, and at the end, there is a report on it. Um, and at the same time, bilateral connections are created between countries to try to create partnerships, which again is relevant to, I think, to the idea of the global approach to migration of the Commission. I'm sorry I can't be more precise, okay. because it is general and it covers everything. Okay, we'll go into the, the questions which we've um, given you some yeah. advance warning. And the first one I'd like to seek your views on is uh, what your view of the EU's global approach, that's to say the document we're looking at, the latest uh, iteration of the input from the Commission on global approach to migration and mobility. And how do you see that as fitting in, uh, if at all, to the UN's approach to the problems and the dialogue that you're conducting? Well, I think, I think, first of all, that the global approach is in many ways, um, as far as I am aware, the most outward-looking um, and cooperation-oriented approach that exists um, uh, in regard to migration in the world today. Um, it, uh, of course, it doesn't address every challenge and opportunity posed by migration, but its basic premise is fundamentally correct, and that is that almost every aspect of migration demands cross-border cooperation um, among states and the key stakeholders. Uh, no state, in other words, is an island and can be an island. And the UN, the UN's approach to migration is very similar, at least as I've tried to describe it to you, however imperfect what we have done is uh, it respects state sovereignty and the right of countries to determine who and how people cross their borders uh, within the bounds, of course, of, of international law and international obligations. But it also seeks to foster cooperation, as I think the uh, global approach to migration of the, of the Commission does. Um, so I'm generally very positively, and in fact, uh, I knew less about it, uh, not that I'm any expert now, before I prepared for this committee than I know now, uh, and uh, I must say the more that I've read it, and I have two collaborators who are more expert than I, who are also volunteers, uh, one in New York, and, uh, and are experts in migration, and though I'm giving hearsay evidence, they also think it is uh, admirable. Lord Tomlinson. Tomlinson. You said in your introductory statement, I think I heard it correctly, that there were ideological objections you know, to the European Commission participating in your global forum. In view of what you said about the Commission proposals for the global approach and the praise that you've heaped upon it, it would be very interesting to know what the ideological objections are. Well, <clears throat> I don't know precisely what the objections are, but uh, I think that they broadly fall under the heading uh, that one of the key elements of the uh, global forum is that this is a state-led process and that the European Union um, and the Commission, the European Union itself, in the first instance, is not, in this context, in the views of, of, of some members, not a, an appropriate party to be afforded uh, significant rights. There is a but they're going to accede to the Council of Europe, they're going to accede to the Court of Human Rights, which is, uh, yeah. The Council of Europe is a body of member states, but they've overcome the difficulties in relation Well, I abso absolutely agree with that, and <coughs> uh, I completely agree with you. And I have made the uh, 
I had better not um, refer to the state that I know is leading the opposition to this, which is not the United Kingdom, but last weekend I spoke to the foreign minister and I spoke to another minister in regard to it, and um, I, I made the points. you've just made, but there is a... And they, of course, have some... And there, there is one other argument that they would make, and probably, although I don't think it stands up either, which is that if you open the door for <coughs> the European Union, then other bodies which are not as constitutionally structured as the EU is might also claim, and how would you draw a boundary between the African Union and yes. the... Known as the objection of the dangerous precedent. Yes. Um, which the... along with the unripe time is um, at, the, at, the, at the, the call of all civil service objectors to anything, <laughs> as you know. Uh, Lord Mackenzie. Mr. Sutherland, in your recent talk at the uh, LSE, you noted that migration must be a more robust part of Europe's foreign and development policy. How might this be achieved? Well, first of all, what I was getting at there was the fact that migration, uh, as I said earlier, tends to be in the dom domain of the Home Office or the Interior Ministry and occasionally of migration or labor ministers if there are designated uh, migration ministers. And at one level, this is entirely sensible given the importance of maintaining uh, border security and so on and of addressing labor market needs. But migration is not actively considered often as part of foreign and development policies in many member states. And what does this mean? It's not a, an argument for greater or lesser migration. It simply accepts that migration has happened and that it will continue uh, to happen. And insofar as it does happen, we must consider its implications uh, for development and foreign relations. It is therefore uh, an issue which goes far beyond the boundaries of uh, the security uh, issue uh, on the state. A great many uh, European countries already have immigrant populations that are proportionately similar to those that exist, for an example, in the United States. Uh, many have an immigrant po population which is over 10% uh, of the foreign-born population um, in countries such as, obviously, the UK. But in my own country, uh, in Ireland, uh, we had um, virtually no immigrants and very many migrants, uh, as, as everybody knows. But we now have 766,000 migrants, making up over 17% of the, of the population, and far more than that in the, uh, in the major cities. Uh, and that has all happened in 10 years. Now, I'm not making a point about, about Ireland, but it's, it's a graphic illustration, even in times of great stress, economic stress. And incidentally, over the last three years, that, three years, that population has increased not decreased with the migrants, uh, immigrants uh, leaving, uh, the mi immigrants leaving and going back to countries of origin, quite the reverse. So it's a phenomenon which is, is everywhere, even in, in countries which have a difficulty, have difficulty. And we need to therefore consider the relationship that migrants have with their countries of origin um, to, and see what, if any, policies could serve to um, amplify the development impact of, of, of their engagement. More, more than 350 billion in remittances is sent back every year from migrants. And uh, the, redu the cost reduction of that has gone from an average of 15% to 8% as a result of some efficiencies and could go far, far lower than that. And the result of that is uh, that an extra 25 billion uh, uh, dollars uh, 
is, is reaching the rightful recipient of those funds. So the migrants, therefore, and migrant policy, I'm rambling a bit, is, is something which it should involve consideration of issues like that, as well as simply how many get in, how many don't get in. Um, To some extent, <clears throat> my question relates back to what you said at LSC, and I have the privilege of being there to hear you say it. Um, it also relates back to your extremely interesting introductory statement. And if I may say so, I was particularly cheered to hear your observations about the need within member countries uh, to bring the variety of departments who have a stake in migration together to see the implications for each department of migration policy rather than just the Home Office or whoever it is. My question is this, to some extent that you have covered it of course, but my question is this, within the European Union there are two objectives. One which seems to be pretty deeply rooted in European institutions, is a commitment to development in the poorest parts of the world. Another is the policy which is emerging certainly in member states, including our own, that immigration should be more targeted towards the people who are needed to help the economy of those member states be efficient. There is potentially a contradiction in this because of course the people who are targeted for immigration may in fact be people who are most needed at home to help in the building of a better future for the people of those countries. How do you think the Commission can help to reconcile these two objectives and to make sure that one is not contradicting the other? Well, first of all, the argument of targeted migration, um, and let me in parenthesis introduce this as you, Lord Judd, as a governor of LSE, will be more than aware. And uh, the whole issue of migration into third level education is not an irrelevant issue in this. And the visa program is something that uh, I would be deeply worried about in regard to both academic staff and uh, students coming into the United Kingdom and the effects that that will have. Uh, and that's not unrelated to what you're saying because the reality is that migrants, many migrants of the targeted type with particular skill sets um, that, and the evidence is clear on this, and for an example, the United States, are migrants who have come in as students and they have become capable of making very significant contributions to the societies of destination because of education and because, because they come in. But coming to your fundamental point, um, <clears throat> I don't think that there, that there is a great deal of evidence which suggests, although it's a popular theory, that a given um, particular uh, priority to skills which are absent is a, a desirable approach to uh, migration and excluding those without those skills. And in fact, uh, in any of the European societies, and I think this probably reading their papers, they would speak for themselves as the Commission's view, the evidence is that the uh, gaps in employment are often, uh, and right across the European Union, are often those at the lowest skilled level rather than the top skills. Now, other examples as well. For an example, in Germany, there are over 50,000 jobs in the engineering sector which need to be filled. 
um, and um, uh, uh, that can be replicated, I'm sure, to a lesser extent in, in many other member states. But um, I don't see that there is an argument in favour of um, limiting migrants to areas of high skill and contribution to high skills into an economy. Apart from everything else, people move from one level of society to another in a properly organized democratic society. And lots of, lots of people who may come in who are unskilled may, as I've said, even without the benefit of going to third level education, may well move up, up the scale. But I, I think I've missed your point. What, could I ask you again, Lord Judd? What, well, I mean, is there anything specific that you would suggest the Commission should be doing about this? Um, I have, I have no immediate, I have no, no immediate answer to that as to what the Commission should be doing. I mean, it should be articulating ideas, but I don't see that it has any direct role in regard to the member states and their policies on this particular issue, other than through discussion and exhortation. But, uh, but you would agree that it's an issue which the Commission ought to watch very carefully? Absolutely. I mean, I think that the Commission's thinking on this whole area is really quite advanced and it, so it has the massive advantage of not being swayed by populism, which inevitably in many political, more directly political environments <coughs> become a relevant factor in the enunciation of migration policy. And you would so say that... that yeah, yeah. If I could just come in, if I've properly understood, you're really saying that you don't think that the EU as such or its member states should be adopting policies to prevent a brain drain from poorer countries to, to more developed ones, nor should they be developing policies to promote a brain gain. You're, you're really taking a, a very free market approach to that. Is yeah. that I, I, have I understood that rightly? Yes. Yes, I, I thought correct. that was what was... Yeah, no, that, that is correct. Um, I think the brain drain concept, incidentally, is hotly contested. Um, at the most basic level, uh, I think that individuals should have a freedom of choice, and therefore you cannot say we're excluding all <coughs> of this category because uh, it will have a negative effect on, on the society from which they come. Nonetheless, it is true, true that certain developing countries suffer a dangerous outflow. For example, in, in uh, skilled doctors in Mali, I know is an example that is often cited. Um, and we have to be vigilant about not doing anything that actively reduces uh, these stocks. But I think the operative words are actively reduce these stocks. I mean, I think that one, 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 uh, that there is a distinction between actively engaging in soliciting individuals and giving them the freedom to make the opportunities that are available to, to them, make the most of them. But uh, also it must be said that uh, the brain gain doesn't necessarily involve poaching work workers. It could be the, prop, uh, the product of a smarter approach to certifying uh, the skills of migrants who are already in Europe um, uh, and who are taking jobs beneath their training, doctors driving taxis in London, for example. Um, so there are a number of things that, 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 uh, that could be looked at in this regard. Uh, Thomas, you would argue that ministers, when they are deliberating these issues, should very much have the points you've made on their agenda. And similarly, it does not, not suggest that the Commission might facilitate thought in this direction by promoting some paper, some research, into the implications of existing member country policies for the overall strategy of the EU. Oh, absolutely. I absolutely believe that. And I believe that the, that the cooperation between the member states rather than... Uh, 
each developing a policy in isolation and a whole range of migration issues is fundamentally important and the Commission has to be the catalyst for that and the thinking behind it. Um, I'm just saying that in the end of the day, the legal authority of the Commission to interfere with the policy in regard to selective migration into a country, however much one might wish some might wish it otherwise, doesn't, I think, exist. So there's only much, so much that can be done. I'm not arguing against the Commission's engagement. I think it's vital. And I think we need a, help, we need a lot more um, uh, cooperation between member states than we have. I think it partly answered the question that I was going to ask uh, Mr. Sutherland, but my question really is how can the EU ensure that immigration control objectives such as border controls and readmission agreements, how can they coexist with development objectives and is the current balance about right? But you also specifically mentioned you know, education as one of the areas and I asked what thoughts you might have about the UK target of reducing net migration, which is the target that they, how they're measuring the target, you know, from tens of thousands, you know, two tens of thousands from hundreds of thousands, and the impact that that is having, particularly on higher education, where incoming students are counted as economic migrants and are therefore <coughs> you know, uh, quite often deterred from coming here because of the, both the difficulty of getting visas you know, and the perception that they're not welcome. Well, taking, uh, taking your last point, I, I know that uh, uh, LSE takes this issue terribly seriously of um, the educational establishments in this country, there is hardly a university that could compare in terms of the total number that we have uh, from um, outside the European Union uh, within, within, within LSE. <coughs> and it's also true, and uh, if anything, um, I think I'm correct in saying that it is considered to be equally important that the academic staff should not be exclusively from within the European Union. And that it's very important that we should not send a signal from this country either to potential student applicants of the highest quality uh, that, 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 or to academic staff that this is in some way an unsympathetic environment in which to seek visas or whatever other permissions or requirements are necessary. And I would be fearful that that could be a signal that might be given of a society which, <coughs> as an observer and a, somebody who resides in the UK as coming from outside the UK, I've always viewed and still view as a most tolerant, open uh, society which has been welcoming to migrants. So, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's very important that that signal should not be given. Uh, even at the more mundane, practical level, it would be massively damaging to the third level education sector in terms of the resourcing, both intellectual and indeed financial, that results from here, huge numbers coming to this country and many stay, many stay, as we have found looking at the graduates who come through LSE, many of them stay and contribute substantially to, 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 to the United Kingdom. You're probably aware of the reasons the government gives for treating uh, university students as economic migrants is because they prey and aid uh, a guideline uh, issued by the United Nations so long ago that I can't remember when it was, uh, which says that anybody who stays for a year is an economic migrant. Uh, they seem to ignore the fact that most of the UK's competitors in the higher education sector, like the United States, Canada, and Australia, do not apply this guideline at all. And secondly, that the guideline, of course, has no mandatory or legal application. Uh, I imagine you're familiar with that uh, 
Yes, but, uh, yes, but uh, I, I think that the argument has no substance whatsoever. And, Absolutely, uh, I agree. I mean, I, I've looked at, as an old UN hand, I've looked, at, looked into this, and it, it frankly isn't, it doesn't hold water. No. Uh, this is not a, a piece of international <laughs> law. No, absolutely not. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's, it provides no justification at all for the, for, for the position that we're talking about. So, I agree. Lord Avery. Sorry. Yes, it is Lord Avery. Sorry. Yes, sir. This leads into <coughs> my question, which is about domestic politicization of immigration issues across Europe. <coughs> and what do you think of the prospects for multilateral initiatives on migration? Do you, do you really think it's possible for the EU to speak with one voice on migration as the co Commission's communication on the GAM proposes? And how do you think that could be achieved? <coughs> First of all, there's no doubt that there are differing attitudes to migration and different elements, for an example, in the member states of the Union at present in terms of attitudes to it. We have seen in some of the most liberal societies in Europe to our surprise, to everyone's surprise, the development of political parties who have a significant role in governance, who have uh, policies which could only be described as racist. Um, and they, 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 the difficulty of bringing about a full uh, agreement between the members of member states of the European Union on issues like migration, which are so <coughs> toxic, apparently, um, uh, politically, is difficult, I accept. To achieve. Having said that, the degree of cooperation that can be required can can be developed between the member states can have an enormously beneficial effect on the level of domestic debate on important issues relating to uh, re relating to attitudes to um, the development of of um, migration policy, and <clears throat> I think that the EU. Um, through its expertise and the experience that it has throughout the European Union can be of great help in developing common positions. But I do accept that in the end of the day, as I said earlier, it's difficult to see the EU as the instrument at present which determines the law at national level in, in, in significant respect in regard to third party country migrants. I wonder if the Global Forum could have some, some influence on European policy in, in some of these respects. And for example, I'm thinking of family reunification, where the, the rules are different between various European countries and may be affected, as you say, by the development of racist uh, political parties in some of, the, some of the member states. But I mean, is it possible that the Global Forum, um, or has it, in fact, considered the question of family reunification and the need for countries which are receiving primary migrants to allow spouses and dependents to come in on the same basis? Because surely, in, a, in a, uh, the European Union, it would be extremely incongruous to have widely different uh, policies between one state and another in whether or not they allow spouses and dependents in and under what conditions they have to be allowed in. So, I mean, for instance, is it possible that the Global Forum amongst the papers that are produced uh, for discussion uh, would consider the question of family reunification because if they did, it might have a profound influence on European thinking. Um, <clears throat> yes, it is a subject that has been discussed and will be discussed. I think that a far higher percentage, as I understand it, of immigrants to Europe come through the family reunification path 
so to speak. That is, they're not selected for their labor uh, market qualifications, and thus, uh, sometimes it must be said, struggle to find work. But having said that, uh, the uh, humanitarian aspects and the requirement of a, an open approach to family reunification is something which is discussed and I think is a very important element of the Global Forums debate. Did you say that, that it had been discussed in the Global Forum? Is it? It, it has been. It is has been discussed. Um, uh, what, what's the status of papers that are produced for the Global Forum? On, on they, the well, the, the status of the papers produced by the Global Forum are not conclusions or decisions because it's a non-decision-making body. And uh, a number of member states have been, cru that has been the crucial element in the debate about what it is and where it's going. Because the normative end is considered to com be completely off limits by a significant number of northern or countries of destination. They won't allow it. So uh, the, all that the Global Forum does, and I don't want to make claims for it that it cannot uh, live up to, is it provides a forum for discussion rather than decision. I mean, for an example, the Domestic Workers Convention, which I very much believe should be adopted, and I can understand why it might be adopted, is, uh, has not been adopted by many and ratified by many member states, um, and uh, including the United Kingdom. Um, but that whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, the Domestic Workers Convention or, the, uh, or any of the other conventions relating to migration is not a subject which the Global Forum is allowed to discuss. Are the, are the documents that are discussed at the Global Forum uh, on a website? Or yes. They are. Yeah. So we could ask our, our <coughs> clerk to I, visit I, the I, website I, yes, yeah. and see I, whether there's anything relevant to these good. There is pressure. Thank you very much. So, and to some extent, you touched on the question I'm going to ask, but it will be helpful to hear from you a little bit of detail. How do you think the EU, EU should cooperate with other international organisations, including the United Nations? <coughs> I think that the EU should have a role in that cooperation, as I indicated earlier. But I think that there is a, a significant barrier to it, and that is a number of member states oppose the idea of the European Union playing a role, um, uh, including a role simply as an observer in the global forum. It was an observer status that was uh, objected to. Um, I find. I find that hard to understand, to be honest with you. But it's, it's, and that would suggest to me that it's a hardline ideological position, which is related to um, a very. And I should say that one member state, which is a, a very great supporter of the whole process, is one of the member states which is uh, which objects to this. So if, I think it's not related to uh, any desire to to uh, hamstring the um, Commission or the Global Forum itself from discussing issues. It's simply a position that the European Commission should not play a role in this type of discussion. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping that um, we will, I've, I've addressed the Council on one occasion, it must have been about five or six years ago, uh, on, on the issue of the Global Forum and I'm hoping that that opportunity will arise again in the future. But I imagine it's not totally um, absent from the concern that if the European Union speaks with a single voice at the forum, then the legal implications of that uh, within the European Union, given the various rulings of the European Court of Justice, can lead to a kind of reverse leverage. I imagine that's uh, probably one of the reasons, but I don't, like you, I cannot quite see why that applies to the Commission being an observer at the meeting, which doesn't seem to me to create any competence at all. No. But um, anyway, it's something which we will certainly need to look into among the many other aspects we do. Can you stop? 
did say in the introduction that the EU has been quite helpful. Yes, yeah, been tremendously helpful in the background. In what ways have they been helpful? Well, they've been helpful in, in papers, in ideas, um, in discussions with <coughs> the small group that is trying to keep the show on the road, so to speak. Um, they have uh, they have now indicated, and they have in the past provided some financial support, and I think that they may provide a lot more. I mean, the argument in terms of the uh, development part of the nexus, the nexus between development and migration, is that it can really be argued that development funds, and I think the Commission have taken this on board, that development funds available to them can be spent in smaller amounts with greater effect through the development of policies around the world, in Europe in particular, of course, which uh, link the diaspora, circular migration as an issue, the diaspora, diaspora uh, bombs, for an example, are being discussed. The World Bank has come through the through the Global Forum to talk about the idea of diaspora bonds, which of course has been massively successful in the case of, of, of uh, Israel, which is so generous, but it has worked in other cases. And <coughs> also the whole idea of governments and countries having a role in using the diaspora, or helping the diaspora to link in to industry in their home country and circular migration falls into the same into, into the same issue. So the Commission has played a big role, I think, in the intellectual formation of some of the ideas. So if I understand you right, there is a dialogue at an official level, but, but there is an objection them having the status at the at the forum itself. They they yes, they have no they have no they have no status in the forum itself. But and, the dialogue and, and their inf their influence is via the conduit of member states rather than directly into the global forum, because the global forum has no uh, has no existence other than myself and two collaborators, really. Uh, right. And the the organisation of the structure is around the, what I explained: the troika, the steering group, and, and the general membership of the UN. Something we need to explore, Lord Shark. I, you mentioned that uh, migration uh, into Ireland uh, had increased, uh, perhaps counterintuitively, over the last few years of uh, economic uh, stress. And I wondered what your general view was of the impact of the global economic and financial crisis on trends in migration. I'd also be interested in, in your views on the impact that demographic trends uh, are having or likely in Europe are having or likely to have uh, on migration patterns uh, over time? Well, <clears throat> I mean, if, you, if one looks at the key arguments and issues relating to migration and the need for migration, the demographic is the most fundamental. And <clears throat> the challenges, demographic challenges, in a number of European member states however difficult it may be to explain this to the citizens of those states, is absolutely unquestionable in terms of crucial dynamic for economic growth. And uh, declining population, aging population, is uh, destructive uh, of prosperity, forgetting about the moral aspect of, of migration entirely. And that's particularly relevant to a number of the countries of Central Germany itself is a, is a, as a major issue, but also some of the southern states. So the demographics are a key element in this debate and a key argument for, and I hesitate to use the word because people have attacked it, for the development of multicultural states. It's impossible to uh, consider that the degree of homogeneity which is implied by the, by the other argument, uh, can survive because states have to become more open states in terms of the people who uh, inhabit it, uh, <coughs> just as the United Kingdom has, has demonstrated. Uh, with regard to the evidence in regard to uh, 
uh, increased or decreased migration because of the economic crisis. Uh, there is obviously political evidence that the economic crisis and the development of higher unemployment rates leads to some of the toxicity in national debate which we referred to earlier in terms of migrants. <coughs> High unemployment rates often have that effect. But it's not always the case. The evidence in regard to Spain, for example, which has notoriously the highest level of unemployment, remains that it is an extremely tolerant society, not, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the fact that it has had, as uh, no doubt children in, in, in Spain are constantly taught, uh, 800 years of, of uh, North African occupation or whatever uh, in its history. But I mean, it's an extremely tolerant society. So it's not everywhere that one finds this. But the strains are of economic difficulty and the implications to migration are, are, I think, pretty clear. But as to the numbers, I don't think that there, that there is evidence of as, uh, as demonstrated by the Irish example, there isn't evidence that there's a huge fall off in migratory flows into the countries which are in difficulties. Uh, and uh, I don't think that the figures are greatly different today to what they were seven years ago when uh, some of the peripheral countries had um, apparently buoyant economies as opposed to today. I think, I think as far as intra-EU migration yeah. is concerned, there have been some quite considerable evidence in this country of a drop in, for example, Polish and Baltic yeah. uh, population here going back again, partly because the Polish economy has been doing rather better than the British economy. Yeah. Uh, and so that is true, but I think uh, what you're responding to more is uh, is uh, that global migration from outside yeah. the European Union. Yes, Lord Richard. I was just uh, looking at the notes we've got, got speaking notes at the LSE, which I would say I found fascinating. And on this particular point, which was the relationship between if you like, demographic trends, immigration, and uh, economic development. Um, you make two or three points to the LSE, which are slightly different, I think, from the ones we've been making today, and I wonder if you could clear it up. I mean, the LSE were quite strong in stating that um, the patterns of migration are interesting because of there are new poles of attraction. In other words, it's not just the traditional uh, places like Europe and the United States, it's now uh, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, Mexico, and all the rest of it. At one stage, we said this, not, slightly, not quite sure what you meant. We said, put another way, we're seeing a shift from states selecting migrants to migrant selecting states. Now, that I understand as a concept. As a result, our ability to compete on a global level is at risk. Now, what should you mean by that? But I suppose that I, I, I suppose I suppose that I was saying that um, if you have limitations in a society which previously had no limitations in regard to migrants coming in, that you end up depriving yourself economically, if that's the only issue that you're concerned with, of the benefit of the migrants who would otherwise come in, because they have other alternatives and that the migrant flow between uh, so-called developing countries is itself developing very rapidly, particularly in the ASEAN and other areas. And many of these are people who this society should want from an economic point of view. But there's no doubt in, in, in your mind, Henry, that migration is an economic plus. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think, it's an, I, think, I think it's a moral plus but I think it's also an economic plus and uh, not something to be rejected. Just one small thing uh, that I'd like to clear up. You talked apparently critically about, um, or, or you know, quite uh, praisingly, of multiculturalism. 
Yeah. Uh, don't you think that we've had, uh, for a long time, a rather false dichotomy between integration and, yes. uh, yeah, yes. uh, and multiculturalism? Absolutely. You know, they're not choices, they're both imperatives. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm merely saying that those who argue that, they, yeah. that, that, that we all have to actually have exactly the same outlooks on everything, I accept that we need a fundamental acceptance of the values and the basic norms. And the language. And the language. Yeah. And, and above all, uh, the concept which is fundamental to my mind to Europe, which is the principle of the equality of man and the dignity of man and all that both of those imply. And migrants have to be prepared to accept that. Yeah. But having said that, once that is accepted, it seems to me that the world in which we're going to move and increasingly are moving is a multicultural world. Yeah. Supplement to that, is there not a case for sort of self-leveling, natural um, leveling off uh, between integration and multiculturalism? I think that there is a tendency to that, and it's probably a very good thing, but um, uh, absolutely, I think that there is a tendency. Thank you, Lord. My, my question is, uh, you referred to the different levels of um, uh, governmental um, ability to integrate uh, migration in various other countries in the EU. Um, and I think you also said that the, um, the checklist, the uh, questionnaire you sent round, uh, was that uh, among the EU members or, or the global? Uh, oh, the global, 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 global. Forum. right. Thank you very much. I mean, the whole the whole point of the global forum, incidentally, is to make the point that um, apart from the bilateral approaches, which um, are fundamental, for an example, to to uh, to the global approach of the EU. Um, <clears throat> that that is not the only thing that you have to look at when you look at migration, because when you look at the migration flows, it is a global phenomenon. It's not simply dealing with North Africa or uh, even Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa. It's a global issue, and therefore we need, and that was the rationale behind the global forum in the first place, that uh, the US and Mexico are blinded in their discussion. That's an, ex that's an exaggeration, but there seems to be a ex great focus on the Latin America connection and the dialogue between North and South. But the US also needs a forum, as does Europe, which encompasses more than the neighborhood policies which are necessary for harmony within a region or between regions. So my real question is, um, what uh, about the EU? Um, there are obviously different levels of enthusiasm for migration among EU members. And what is the EU's role, in your view, should be um, to improve the economic and social integration of the immigrants in Europe, particularly the second and third generations? I think, I think it's, it, it, it's, its role has to be to develop within the member states themselves responses uh, which take account of the best experiences of the best of the European states, uh, some of which are making enormous efforts in this area. For example, uh, one could look at, uh, at Sweden, for an example, where uh, there is a very advanced policy, um, and indeed Spain has also a policy in regard to looking at the societies and going into the societies from which migrants come to try to uh, adjust them and before they come to what the reality is of the society into which they're uh, migrating. So I think that the EU's role is uh, to bring together the best thinking and to bring the member states together in the best approach, common approach, to this, to this issue. Would you, in your major civil states, agree and endorse, agree with and endorse the data coming from OECD, which suggests that the employment rate 
of migrants in uh, Europe, across Europe, is lower than within the United States and Oceania. If you do agree with that uh, data, what do you think the European Union should be doing about it? And why do you think it's happening? Well, first of all, I, I've no doubt that the data which you which you which you uh, recite uh, is, is is accurate. I I have I haven't actually read it, and I don't I don't know the the answer to what you're saying. My immediate reaction to it uh, would be no different to uh, anyone else's. I would imagine that if the uh, European example is much poorer in terms of the integration of um, uh, workers into the society in terms of their getting jobs, that it is re related to the fact that the United States or Australia and New Zealand are migrant societies and that therefore they accommodate more readily those from other backgrounds than we do ourselves who still nurse a sense of our homogeneity and difference from others, which is precisely what the European Union, in my view, should be doing its best to undermine. Well, on that note, uh, you've given us a, a, a very rich diet today. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It's been a, a privilege to, to hear your views on this, and I think you've helped us a great deal in this first uh, evidence session of what is going to be quite a long process. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. <laughs>